My name is Martin Powers. My field is uh, the history of Chinese art. Summer Mountains really marks a watershed in Chinese history and even in world history. Every aspect of the painting tells you something about Chinese society and government during the 11th century under Song government, which really represents the Song state, the Song polity. Today I'd like to share with you some personal thoughts I have about the scroll Summer Mountains in the Metropolitan Museum of Art. Dating to the first half of the 11th century, they invented the panoramic landscape. And the painting in the Metropolitan Museum is one of the earliest of that sort. This painting is painted in a very naturalistic style. A naturalistic style basically says, this is a fact. What you're looking at is all factual. So let's have a look at the beginning of the scroll. We find a number of boats docked at the shore. Some of these may be fishing boats. Many of them are commercial boats. This is saying we really have boats like this. We have commerce. We have commercial activity going on. And then as we get a little bit past the scroll, the middle of the scroll, we find two things that are, have been very important in Chinese culture and still very important today, and that is restaurants and a tea house. The restaurant is further up, the tea house is further down. This restaurant is very interesting because it's situated in the middle of the countryside with beautiful views on all sides. Almost every customer could enjoy the view. Further down is a smaller but still very nice tea house. It's built over a stream, right where the rocks, the water runs over the rocks. The capital investment in a building like that would have been enormous. It would only pay off if there was a huge market for restaurant food, which we know there was. The Song no doubt had the most sophisticated economy in the world at that time. You could see it in the painting. There was no aristocracy in Song times. If you could afford it, you could go there. Now, if you look outside the tea house, you'll see that there's a, a mule merchant heading for that same tea house. This is typical of Song Dynasty paintings. We find that many spaces were shared by people, by scholars, by officials, by merchants, by farmers. People of all different kinds of backgrounds could gather together. There was no rigid class distinction. So this speaks to a very, a flourishing commercial culture and civilization. In fact, every aspect of the painting tells you something about Chinese society and government during the 11th century under Song government. So now you might say, where is the emperor? Where are the officials? Interestingly, the landscape is kind of a metaphor for for the nation, these different mountains that go all throughout. And in between, and that is this mist that flows throughout the painting. Among the mountains, there's the tallest mountain. The tallest mountain was kind of a metaphor for the emperor. The smaller mountains are metaphors for the various officials. The mist is a metaphor for beneficial policies. Why are these aspects of government conveyed in terms of natural forms like mountains, valleys, mist, rivers, and things like this. The word for nature, by the way, in Song times is tian di. Tian and di is like qian kun, that is the yin and yang. So the landscape represents the whole natural order and natural process, and within that natural order, society takes place. It's what the Chinese call qian ren he yi, that is to say that society is part of nature. You can argue as you want what nature does, but there's no denying that it promotes life. Then there's another important part to the painting. The landscape painting is full of these bridges. All this was done with, with public taxes. The public taxes were all used for these public purposes to help the people. And so uh, in the painting, you see uh, more than one uh, tavern and there's a flag outside the tavern. And that flag means that this tavern is registered with the government, so it will collect taxes all those bridges and roads you see in the landscape painting. 
They're paid for with taxes on the tea and the wine and salt. So the restaurants and the tea houses are an important part, not only of this scroll, but of other landscape paintings of this type in Song times. So these are all things that you might easily overlook. Government has a responsibility to help make the people's lives better. And this idea eventually made its way over to uh, Europe and to England. Intellectuals in Europe, Enlightenment intellectuals, like François Canet, like uh, Etienne du Silhouette, like uh, Thomas Jefferson, found this uh, very attractive. They liked the idea. Another feature of the painting, which is typical in these big panoramic paintings that stand for China, is a motif called the donkey rider. And in this painting, you'll see a bridge. One of the bridges, there's a man on a donkey crossing the bridge. You will find this in almost every panoramic landscape from this period. What does it stand for? Well, my colleague Peter Sturman did much of the initial research on that, and others have done more research since. Basically, this is meant to be an impoverished poet who goes around the country writing poems about injustice. In China, both in the in Song Ming Qing Dynasty, all had these formal channels for complaining about problems with government. So in Chinese, this was the Deng Wen Gu Yuan, Deng Wen Jian Yuan. In English, uh, I'd like to call it the grievance offices. So there was a great deal of discussion in Song times about public opinion and how important it was for government. Many statesmen like uh, Sima Guang and Chen De Xiu, both famous Confucians, argued that this was the most important feature in government. So paintings like this really represented a totally new understanding of government and its relation to the people. Now, in the case of China, this marks an especially important shift because in China's medieval period, say during the Tang Dynasty, or even earlier, 5th, 6th, 7th, 8th, 9th century, the idea of China was represented by the emperor. Now, in Song China, we do not find pictures of the emperor standing for China, but you can see almost every detail has something to do with the state, with the way the state functions. It really marks a watershed in Chinese history and even in world history.